Well, welcome everyone to another session of uh, the Robotics Roadmap for Australia version two. This is our workshop on the space sector. And uh, I, my name is Sue Kay. I'm the Research Director for Cyber Physical Systems with CSIRO's Data61 and was the architect of the first Robotics Roadmap for Australia. So first, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the different lands on which we are all meeting today virtually and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I guess our journey began when the first robotics roadmap was uh, launched in uh, mid 2018, although I guess it really did start quite a way before that. This first roadmap was really the first attempt to try and capture the capability that existed in Australia and to try and define the robotics industry uh, that we have here in this country. Um, it was based very strongly on the format of the US robotics roadmap, which after three editions has actually led to the investment of more than $100 million into robotics R&D in that country. So I guess that's something that we can certainly uh, hope to aspire to in the future. But our reason for doing the roadmap and the reason for doing an update of the roadmap hasn't changed. The process of doing the roadmap has been important to define why robotics is important in Australia to help us unearth the capability that exists here in Australia in the space and really to put forward some solid economic arguments for why we need to have a robotics industry in this country. So the roadmap came up with a couple of different recommendations uh, and we grouped those according to their impact on different sectors and a number of these are relevant for the space sector. Uh, we think that you know, we can have an important role in stimulating the formation of new high tech firms. Um, we also need to encourage VC investment in this area and to develop some aspirational research challenges. But importantly, I think uh, a key role that the space sector can play in, in how robotics develops in Australia is, a, is around harnessing the nation's imagination. Because I think everyone can, um, everyone, everyone's imagination is expanded by thinking about applications in space and that can have a number of, you know, sometimes surprising and good impacts on the applications that we can apply here on Earth. One of the uh, great things about putting the first robotics roadmap together were some of the examples we found of where Australia really was leading the world in different areas of robotics and some great stories that I think need to be told in terms of the contribution that we're making in different areas. Uh, this is something that we're hoping to continue in the next version of the roadmap and hopefully we'll be able to add some applications in the space sector to this list of achievements very soon. One of the keys of the first roadmap was trying to map the capability. All of the little red dots on the, uh, on the country there represent different companies that have a robotics capability here in Australia. Um, it wasn't so easy to define what those companies looked like because not all, of them so, not all of them necessarily describe themselves in terms of the word robotics. And many of them are working on related technologies. So sensing systems, computer vision, um, a whole range of different areas. So when we looked at capability, we looked at both robotics and robotics related technologies and found that, and we think this is quite a conservative figure, that there's actually more than a thousand companies operating in this space in Australia, employing more than 50,000 people and generating more than $12 billion revenue for the country every year. And I think, you know, one thing that we can all aspire to, you know, with having finally an Australian space agency is, uh, you know, an opportunity that exists for us to really lead the world in remote exploration, mining, mineral processing uh, and other activities that could be applied in space that really harness a lot of the key strengths that we already have as a nation. And uh, quite a few Australian researchers were involved in the development of the Mars rover. I think there's a lot more work that we can be doing in that area. And ultimately something that I know I aspire to is that we actually see a piece of 
robotics technology on some of our Australian currency, just like the Canadians currently enjoy with their Canada arm, which they supplied for the International Space Station. I think, I think you know you made it when your industry actually gets covered on a piece of currency that everyone gets to use and see every day. So perhaps that's something that we can aspire to for Australia as well. Now, a reason for doing a second version of the robotics roadmap is to keep the momentum going from the first roadmap to encourage the skills uh, to be developed that we need to make the sector be successful, to identify where Australia can make a difference. I've already put forward a few ideas about that now, to keep unearthing the capability that already exists in the country, and finally, to really establish a clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia. Because we've had to move these workshops to virtual format, it does limit the uh, amount of interaction we can have. Thank you for those of you who have already completed our survey. But if you would like to have a say in what goes into the roadmap, then please complete our survey and we would welcome your input and in particular any case studies you have of great work being done here in Australia. Our agenda today, uh, first we'll be hearing from Nick Larkham from the Australian Space Agency. Then Ed Cruzens from CSIRO, Mark Masiri, who's formerly from NASA, uh, and Jonathan Ralston and Ross Dungerville, my colleagues from CSIRO, will be taking us through the Q&A and a bit of feedback uh, that we can give you from some of the survey results so far. So thank you everyone for joining. I'd like to also thank my co-chairs, Ross Dungerville, Jonathan Ralston, Mark Masiri and Nick Larkham. Uh, and uh, remember, if you like a copy of the roadmap, uh, you can just ask for a copy. So um, please let us know your details and we'll send one through to you. Uh, but we will get started now on our first presentation. And I am very happy to be welcoming Nick Larkham from the Australian Space Agency to talk with us about the Australian Robotic Roadmap and the Space Agency contribution. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks Sue and good day everyone. My name is Nick Larkham. I'm with the Australian Space Agency. I'm part of the programs and capabilities team. And Sue, I, I do see that we do want to have robots in the bank note, but I fear that our problem might be we might have so many successful programs, we won't know which ones to put on there. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you a little bit of a what the agency is and why we are, why we are, an update on what we're doing, and then explain about the Space Agency's robotic roadmap and how it fits into the National Australian Roadmap. Alrighty, next slide. So the agency's purpose is to grow a respectable Australian space industry that lifts the broader economy and inspires and improves the lives of Australians. This is really important. So this is why the agency was created. So everything comes down to us achieving this purpose. Next slide. So from there, we really step onto what our responsibilities are and what our values are. So we take these very seriously in the agency and whenever we're not sure, we turn back to these to lead our direction. So we have quite a range of responsibilities. Some of these are similar to other space agencies, others are not. And then on the right, we have our values. And these are different again and similar to other agencies. So we are slightly different, but we're trying to a new approach. Next slide. So all of our thinking and direction comes from our civil space strategy. This was published at the end of 2019. From there, we have four pillars. It's the international, we're opening doors. National, we're building up you guys. Regulation, we're making sure nobody's getting hurt, we're doing it safely. And more importantly, we're inspiring the nation to do more and greater things. Next slide. So we're two years old. Uh, that happened a couple of weeks ago. So lots have happened. Um, we've, we're opening up new doors. We're doing all of that admin stuff. We know that we want to work with everybody, but there's a few steps we need to go through to make sure it's all official. We've opened up our new headquarters at Lot 14 in Adelaide. We're running a range of programs. The one most exciting personally for me is the $150 million for our Moon to Mars, and that's how we will support NASA and the Artemis program. We've had the International Space Initiative and the Space Infrastructure Fund. And for this audience, two parts for that one is the Space Robotics and Automation AI Command Centre has just been announced in Western Australia. And we also have the Mission Control in South Australia. 
and they are open to SMEs. So anyone who wants to be involved can be involved and use these assets. Next slide. So these are all the people we're starting to open door with. So it's really easy to say, yes, we want to work together. Um, and then the actual minutia of going through that and signing all the agreements, um, even more so in the COVID time has made it interesting, but we are making strong progress with partnering with and aligning with our international and national cohort. Next slide. So these are the programs. We've delivered half of these by now. We're still working on the Space Discovery Center. That should be finished start of next year. Yeah, we're getting there depending on COVID again. Um, so the ISI has been announced. The Space Infrastructure Fund has almost been fully uh, announced. Um, and what we're currently working on is the NASA Moon to Mars partnership. And you'll be happy to know we are meeting with NASA again tonight to discuss what we might be doing in the robotics in the ISAU sector. So we are making good progress on this. Next slide. So these are our SPAs or our, uh, priority areas. Um, position navigation timing, earth observation, communications, situational awareness, leapfrog R&D, robotics and automation, which we're here for, and access to space. Next slide. So they're all laid out in our civil space strategy. And then from there, we were required to engage with opportunity. So the next step for that is we are developing a roadmap for each priority area. And I will be discussing the robotics uh, priority area here. Okay, next slide. So from those four pillars into the SPAs, and then we break it down. So we, uh, the other SPAs are quite easy. If you say, who wants to work in Earth observation or who's working in Earth observation? It's, it's pretty simple. You know, you know who's doing what. And as I'm sure Sue discovered last time when she was doing the roadmap, it's a very wide range of people who are working in the robotics, automation and remote operations. And talking about our mining heritage, ISIU is in-situ resource utilization, which is basically you're using what is there. And for that is us, that's the mining and resources and our real experience. And so I'll talk about the robotics segment. Next slide. So I've prepared some spoilers. I'm going to tell you what we're not doing um, because unfortunately we don't have NASA's budget yet. If you guys do some amazing work in the next 10 years, we will see how we go, but we're not looking at building three ton Curiosity rovers, not yet. And we're not looking at doing crazy in space, huge robotics attached to the space station, not yet. That's why we might want to, Australia doesn't really have that experience to start. Our competitive advantage is down in the dust. Next slide. So what we are looking at doing, so conducting research over the last couple months and talking with everybody and trying to figure out where we fit. So a few of the areas which we're getting great feedback on and which we do uh, expect to operate in, even though we, have, we haven't completed our former review is mobility platforms. It's all very well and good to have the instrument but you need to get that instrument to the location. And we are very good at doing dusty, dirty, dangerous things and doing them consistently. Um, interoperability. One of the advantages of kind of not having much in space is we almost have a blank slate. So we're looking to leverage the current existing standards and work together with our current community to make sure that we have interoperability across the entire industry um, for me, it's personally really important that if you gain skills in one company, you can seamlessly transi transition to another. It's about building up a strong workforce and building up a wide supply chain that can supply a wide range of potential activities. And for us, it's the seamless remote operations. It's the doing it well over vast distances. And well, space is built for that, whether we like it or not. Next slide. So. How we're doing all of this, we will admit that we are most definitely not the experts. So we've gone out, we've found the experts, or at least a good range of these. So these are some of the people in our technical advisory group. We work with everybody within this group and we talk to industry. So we go out and find out what's going on and who's doing what and who's right and who's wrong. And then we also get a check from the international and national agencies. 
Next slide. So this is the actual roadmap. This is the Australian Robotics Roadmap. So it's broken down into four steps. So what we've currently been working on and what we've been delegating to the TAG because they know what's best in this area is the state of the art and the gaps. So what are we good at as a nation? What are we bad at as a nation? And where do we want to play? So just because we're good at something doesn't mean we want to do it. It might be done by somebody else and it might not be worth doing. And just because we don't have much experience in that sector also doesn't mean we might not do it. There might be a large demand for it that no one's filling. But the ideal for us is that we play to our competitive advantage and that we fit into a gap with a market demand or at least a national need. The next step is the targets. So where do we want to be in 10 years? So we're currently going through, we've gone through our gaps. We know where we roughly want to be, but the current discussion internally is how much focus do we have? So do we want to do a little bit of everything or do we want to be laser focused on some things? So there's only so much funding and resources and internal capability. So we're kind of trying to balance that within the agency and within the tag and make really long term strategic decisions that will bring wealth and prosperity to Australia and are exciting, are exciting for you people to get involved and get at it and show us what we can do. So internally, they should be delivered by the end of next month, all going well. And then from there we go the pathways. So for us, the pathways is, okay, we know what we want to do, how do we get there? Um, and that will involve lots of industry outreach. Um, we will have multiple options. And again, it's, do we keep it broad enough so every, so there's all the options on the table or, or do we be laser focused? So there's a lot of back and forth in that, but ideally for us and for you and we're, our group in particular is if industry based within the agency, we want a roadmap that you can actually use and is meaningful and has impact. Um, so we are very aware of that. And then from there, we take a draft document out and we consult with industry. So we throw it to you and you show us what's right, what's wrong, what have we missed, what do you love, what do you hate? And then from there, we can, can we perform the, what, the official writing process. So next slide. So that's it. But for me, there's a few things. Um, one, we really actually do care what you think. So fill out the survey. We're going to read it all. If you have interesting stuff, put it in there and you might just be getting a call from us. Um, so I've got my email here. I promise I will read all the emails you send me. I won't promise I'll respond, but I will read them all. So there is that. And then for that, I'm gonna throw you down a challenge. What space robotics are we gonna be doing in five years? What are you gonna be doing? How can you transfer your company to space robotics? And then I'll answer the two questions. if we have any, or we can move on and have some later. Oh, thanks, Nick. I think one has come through the chat and that was a question, just clarifying what you mean by mobile platform. Um, something that moves. I mean, whether it has legs, wheels, screws, hops, thrusts, um, that gets something to another location. Um, we're trying to keep it open and we really do want the innovation. Thanks, Nick. And I think that, you know, there often people are a little slow to warm up. So I'm sure there'll be some questions as we move through the, the next presentations. But, but thank you very much for your presentation, Nick. And our next speaker is Ed Cruzens from CSIRO. And Ed is going to be talking about CSIRO's space heritage and program. Um, looking forward to hearing this. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Sue. And I'll just try and share my slides here. Uh, see how we go. Uh, here it is. Okay. Uh, can everyone see that? All good? Okay. All right. Well, well thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk today and, and also uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, great to, to catch up and uh, talk about um, CSRO's heritage in uh, space. Um, I'm Ed Cruzens. I'm the uh, CSRO Director for NASA Operations and the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex and uh, been in that role for about eight years now. Um, 
Sorrow has an experience and heritage that goes back several decades, nearly six, nearly seven decades. And uh, it's got world-class capabilities. And uh, I'm going to move pretty quickly through a lot of this stuff because I didn't want to leave anything out, I'm afraid. I, it was just uh, a lot of important things there. But, um, but let me indicate uh, what areas they're in. Uh, so the areas I will cover quickly will be in space tracking and ground operations. Uh, and our astronomy and observing facilities and technology. Then swing across to Earth observation systems. And finally wrap with space technology and our future space platform work, which is where we're going in the future. So let's start with the first one, um, space tracking ground stations. And this, is, uh, this begins with our work with the European Space Agency. Um, just not long ago, um, we opened up a contract with ESA in June 2019 to run the Inertia facility in Western Australia. And this capability here uh, tracks European Space Agency missions, and there are several of them to various uh, planetary bodies in the solar system, including uh, Venus, Mars, uh, Mercury, Bepi Colombo mission launched recently, and comets. Um, we have about nine personnel working there at the moment. Previously, they were attached to the Inmarsat uh, group who had the contract before us, but we're now signed up with them. And uh, we've got an exciting future with them. Going to the next slide, of course, they are our sister capability. Um, this is my station here, uh, our work with NASA. This is the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex, and it's been operating for over 50 years. And um, we track about 40 different space missions, not just NASA ones, but also um, ESA ones, uh, ISRO ones, Japanese um, and related. Um, and we have 89 CSRO staff that work there, some with heritages up to 30 years. So it's a place once you come, you never seem to leave. Um, now, you might be confused by the balloon in the top right hand corner. Uh, that's because uh, the NASA contract with CSRO does more than just space tracking. It also does high altitude ballooning. And another one of my jobs is to manage the Alice Springs Ballooning Facility Complex, which is a joint NASA CSRO capability. And they fly altitudes to nearly 40 kilometers carrying payloads of nearly two tons for astronomical and related research. Going back uh, to Canberra Deep Space, I've put this one up here as well. That's our antenna DSS-43. It's 70 metre antenna. And it's actually designed from some of the baseline designing from the Parkes Radio Telescope, which is a 64 metre antenna. Um, as I said to you, we have been there 54 years, approximately. Um, and we'll be using some of these antennas to support the Mars 2020 launch, uh, which will happen on the 30th of June shortly. The station, of course, does a little bit more than just um, space tracking, and this is an area of research I'm personally involved in. This is tracking near-Earth objects. So what we do here in partnership with our colleagues at the Australia Telescope National Facility, we transmit from the large antenna I just showed you, DSS-43. We reflect off an asteroid, in this case, SD-220, which looks like a hippopotamus, and uh, received down at either the Parkes Radio Telescope or at the Narrabri facility up in Narrabri. And in this way, we are anchoring some of the early work for asteroid detection. Asteroids are between uh, 20 to 500 metres in diameter have been tracked successfully using this capability. Uh, distances between 0.7 lunar diameters and 7 lunar diameters. And we're hoping to build this research up uh, further in Australia. Moving right along, let's go to our astronomy observing facilities and technologies. Uh, this is where CSRO really has made its name in terms of space uh, long ago uh, with Parkes and others. So let me swing to the Parkes radio telescope. Uh, this is our iconic uh, capability. It's been at the forefront of some of the greatest astronomical discoveries known, such as the first pulsars, quasars, and even fast radio bursters, uh, which are 
interesting objects that burst for a, a microsecond and they're trying to work out what parts of the sky they're coming from. So the research there is going, well, that's been an operation that antenna, I should say, telescope since 1961, and it played a key role in the Apollo 11 landing uh, together with our sister station at Honeysuckle Creek, which has now been dismantled, unfortunately. Moving to the next slide. Um, this is our facility at Narrabri. It's called the Australia Telescope Compact Array. It's composed of six 22 metre antennas, uh, producing radio images of the galaxy and other sources. And that was opened in 1988. And uh, it actually, as I was saying to you, it's still used um, in support activities for the, some of the radar work we're doing as well as the astronomy work. Uh, the next slide. And this is the forefront of research that's happening at the moment. So the Australian Square Kilometre Array, uh, ASCAP, um, is in Western Australia in Murchison Shire. Um, it's in a very radio quiet zone, uh, so it's attractive in terms of its ability to listen to very, very uh, low um, astronomical sources. And it's composed of 36 12 metre dishes and it has a unique capability and uh, it can view very wide fields of the sky, whereas a normal radio telescope can't. And at the same time, it can observe a number of different frequencies um, between 700 megahertz and 1.8 gigahertz. And, but what makes it so special is the next image. And if you look at the apex of that antenna where the four legs are, you'll see this. And this is a phased array feed system. And why is that a, a special item? It was developed in Australia by the CSIRO. Uh, and this is what gives ASCAP its imaging capability. So instead of having to scan the sky as if you had one pixel on a camera, you can now image it almost like a digital camera with uh, all those little uh, dipoles. There are 188 individual dipoles. You can see the little squares on that circle there. And each of those is a mini receiving antenna. Uh, and so with that, and together with a wide frequency capability, you essentially have a wide field view and you have it in a multiple frequency. So there's new physics that can come out of that capability. They're working on a new phased array feed capability now, a cryogenically cooled one, which will make it even more sensitive. And this is already being exported to a number of countries around the world. So I'll go to the next slide here as well. This is about our Earth observation systems. Um, and we'll start with CSRO SAT-1. So we have a program uh, for a CubeSat. This is a three-year CubeSat, which is in its final stages of production together with our industrial partner, Innovol, uh, and is due for launch to the International Space Station. Um, it was meant to be late 2020, 20. I'll need to get an update on that, but it's still targeted for the ISS. Uh, it will carry a shortwave infrared imager and uh, have onboard processing and it'll be a technology demonstration capability. Um, next slide, Novasar. CSRO has a 10% share in the Novasar system for Earth observation. Uh, this is different to the electronic imager I mentioned earlier on CSRO SAT-1. This has actually got an active synthetic aperture radar and why is that different? Well, radar can penetrate cloud. Optic image uh, systems cannot. And, and what we can use this for is to penetrate cloud, particularly during uh, storms, uh, support disaster warning, um, particularly in Asia and the Asia Pacific area and Australia. It's got a rapid mapping capability and it could be used for humanitarian support and also back up Earth observation using electro-optic images for getting new science out of the parts of the Earth that it observes. It could be used for deforestation detection and fires. And in fact, as part of the bushfire uh, task force, the use of Novasar is now being uh, discussed about whether its utility could be used for the next round. Um, let me go to the next slide. So this is about calibration and validation. So you can take pictures from satellites of the Earth, but you need to calibrate them. And this is the important point here. So this is one aspect of the calibration. Um, 
if you can understand the weather, the reflectivity of the ground in the area you're at and calibrate it, then when you get the image from the satellite, you can correlate the two and make sense of it. This happens to be uh, one part of the CalVal activities. This is the robotic CalVal, which has the ability to drive about, take various measurements, atmospheric or albedo or whatever, uh, and then relate that back to the images that will be received from the satellite. So let me go to the next slide and we're on getting close to the final run. This is about our future science technology platform. This will warm your hearts, of course. Space spiders, agile, autonomous robotics that can be deployed in space uh, to support inspections, repairs, or sustainment of flight systems. Um, these are smart developments uh, that we're very good in Australia in design and autonomy and could give CSRAO Australia a real niche in robotic space exploration. But of course, that's what you're here for. And that's, I'm not going to talk too much more about it because then uh, I'll show up my lack of knowledge compared to everyone else around the table. The next one is uh, developing new processes for um, metal recovery from the regolith simulant. So here we are looking at the extraction of useful materials from things like uh, the lunar regolith or other planetary material from planetary bodies. Um, essentially learning how to live off the land, which is an important factor if you are going to explore planetary bodies. And Sarah is doing some important work in that area. If I go to the next slide, so a lot of the work we're doing with satellite support uh, and other areas is also backed up by ground support. And this is a slide about precision agriculture. So the GPS satellites and the supporting GNSS satellites are being flown by various nations, including the United States. We can exploit the GPS signal. And if we have augmentation of that signal with correcting factors, we can get extreme precision about the position of things on the earth. And this can be extremely useful for optimizing crop returns and investments, uh, and even robotic control on the ground of uh, agricultural equipments and mining equipments. If I go to the next slide, uh, this is one that I heard mentioned a little bit earlier, in situ resource utilization. Um, and we are leveraging the world-class mining capabilities that Australia has uh, for off-world applications. I was pleased to hear from Nick that this could be a real contender in the $150 million Moon to Mars exercise. Um, as I was saying to you, learning to live off the land, getting into the dust and, and doing those jobs is a really powerful niche that Australia could get involved in. And uh, we have a lot of experience and expertise that we could leverage here and uh, place up on the Moon or even further in field into Mars when that time comes. So let me take you to the other slide. This is my personal favourite because I run the FSP program on this one. Um, we are developing together with JPL a optical communications capability, in particular a hybrid capability, so that we can communicate optically and also with radio frequencies, uh, not only back to Earth from places like the Moon and planetary bodies, but also communicate optically through laser channels coming back. The challenge here, of course, is what is the effect of the atmosphere on the laser channel? And we in CSRO understand, uh, have been working on atmospheric aberrations and atmospheric turbulence and other factors for other work for some time, so we can relate to that. Um, the antenna, I should say, in the top right-hand corner is a concept put up by JPL for a 34-metre antenna retrofitted with optical flats uh, which could then also carry optical laser signals at 1550 nanometer, as well as RF signals in the X band and the K band. So that if you do get cloud cover, you can still gracefully degrade into the RF. And we're talking about one gigabit per second uh, capabilities out to, as far as the moon. And we're hoping this might be part of the conversations as well as we go towards Lunar Gateway and Artemis. And so uh, let me go to the next slide here. Rollable solar arrays, 
Um, agile and flexible solar arrays for maximizing solar power and its ubiquity in space applications and, and uh, resources like that, and its resilience. And the wonderful thing about this is it's so resilient. It's rollable, it's easily deployable, and therefore easily bestowable and, and therefore deployable as well, particularly when you're mass constrained and, and volume constrained if you need to go uh, space. Let me take you to the next slide. Uh, uh, this is about developing new space sensors to be used in space, uh, looking back at the Earth and maybe looking down at other planets for water uh, and other forms of inventory that might be valuable. Uh, in Australia, but also off world. And here's an example of a hyperspectral sensor that's being developed in CSRO with fine spectral use, uh, spectral resolution, uh, which if you're looking back at Earth, could be useful for spotting the telltale factors in plant and water spectrums. And let me take you to my last slide. Here is uh, an interesting one. Um, and we're proposing the uniqueness of the Australian environment here, particularly the harshest environments to test lunar and Martian equipment on the earth before it goes into space. We call these analogs. And there are various analogs that we have in Australia that are very close to Martian type activity uh, surfaces and also lunar, particularly in the Pilbara area um, and the Red Centre. Um, and so we're talking actively with NASA and other entities to see if they would like to test their equipments in Australia. And with that, there's always a scientific spin-off. But not only that, you wouldn't uh, believe this, but Antarctica is a wonderful analogue for biomedical and psychological analogues as well as you go into deep space, particularly when it comes to isolation. So this is an area that we're, we're trying to build up as well. So let me wrap by saying that um, CSRO is a long heritage stretching back over six decades and more uh, in space exploration, starting with playing key roles from the ground. And now we're looking at playing uh, roles in space in a variety of special technologies, leveraging our unique skills and insights into mining, robotics, space sciences, communications, energy, sensors, biomedicine, agriculture, and I'll come back to again, robotics, which this conference is all about. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. So um, I'm not sure whether any questions have come in the Q&A for Ed yet. There's a bit of chat uh, around uh, whether there are solar panels that have been space tested. I don't know whether you know the answer to that, Ed. In general, there's, there's many solar panels that have been space tested, but I don't know the, the Australian ones have yet or whether the flexible ones have yet because the space environment is particularly harsh, not only from a vacuum point of view, because even simple materials like metals will outgas in vacuums, but also uh, whether the solar fluences coming from the sun, the energetic particles will have an impact on the plastics. So um, I don't believe we've tested these solar um, um, flexible arrays in space yet, but it would be an interesting thing to do so, because if we could and make it work, it would be another niche. Thanks very much, Ed. So I think everyone is holding fire until the, the big Q&A session. So, uh, thanks again, Ed, and we'll move on to our next speaker. Mark Masiri uh, is formerly from NASA, but we're very fortunate to have him move to Australia and be available for this presentation. And Mark will be talking about advanced robotics for remote operations and space applications. Sure, thank thanks, you, Sue. Mark. Do you have, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so, um, my name is Mark Masiri. I am currently the head of robotics for Woodside Energy. Um, I'm formerly, before coming to Woodside, um, I was the head of robotics at NASA Ames um, out in uh, Mountain View, California. Um, prior to that, I was a DARPA program manager for a little while. And I think most importantly for this conversation, I was the engineering lead for the SPHERES um, uh, International Space Station facility. 
And uh, the important part and what I'm going to try to kind of frame this presentation in um, was that um, my team and I not only learned how to uh, take equipment, either robotic equipment or off the shelf equipment, certify it for use in space, um, and then not only how to fly it ourselves, but then as a facility, we helped others do that. Um, and so I'll say that I had the kind of unique um, experience to be able to watch a whole lot of get certified for flight. Um, and so I'm going to provide kind of some hints and other things as to how um, some of the uh, technologies and, and as a roadmap, how we might position ourselves well um, to be able to, to achieve flight. Um, it's important for this conversation um, and to know that none of the content in this presentation represents the views of my current employer, uh, Woodside, or the views of NASA or any of my uh, past employers. Um, and in fact, all of the content that you're about to see in this presentation is in the public domain. Um, and, and for any of the things that are presented, I'm happy to provide where those came from. Um, the three groups of people that I think the pres that this presentation is going to be most useful to. Um, the first, if you're if you're a space expert and you have experience flying things, a lot of this is going to be kind of review for you. The the main um, target audience for this is if you have some ideas and you want to see if your ideas apply to the Australian space initiatives here or the roadmap. Um, and then also, if you don't know anything about space um, and and are a roboticist and you want to contribute. Um, this will hopefully give you some good leads to uh, to go track down. So let me first talk about kind of the framing here. So one of the things that we used to discuss back in my uh, my former group was the different roles that robotics could play um, in man's exploration of space and other bodies. Um, right now, uh, we are in a phase where we have a lot of precursor missions that are happening. So these would be the Mars rovers. Um, the picture you see on the left there, that is um, what's, what's called Viper. So that is a rover that will hopefully be going to the moon soon that is looking for volatiles, looking for minerals, water, other things like that. Um, so the main, uh, some of the main roles here are mineral exploration. Um, the the idea that you're identifying the minerals and that very tightly tunes the places that you are going to land on the moon um, becomes very very important from a mission formulation uh, part of the process um, and is absolutely for any proposals or anything else that you're working you really need to be able to talk about the, the the science of why you're going there and what are the resources that you hope to be able to benefit from Mapping and surveying. So one of the things that as we started, uh, my group started looking at how to um, have robots operate on the moon, you realize very quickly that even for the moon, which is a relatively close body to the earth, um, that we really, the, the resolution of the imagery that we have um, is in tens of meters. Um, so let's let's take the, the low end of that. And let's say it's it, we have 10 meter resolution. Um, if you're coming in on, let's say, for a landing on the moon, and it's your robot and your lander versus a 10-meter rock, um, the rock is probably going to win in that in that landing. Um, in fact, when you go back and look at the successes that Apollo had uh, and all of the other lunar missions that have been able to land on its surface, um, it's quite amazing that we've done as well as we have with the resolution of imagery that we do have. Um, for robots wandering around on the moon um, and, and on Mars, it would be very, very useful for the robots in those precursor missions to go create higher resolution maps and to essentially do surveying. When we start talking about leveraging habitats and other um, kind of more fixed facility type things, your ability to do surveying um, on the ground becomes paramount to the correct selection of landing sites and other things like that. Um, we talked earlier about in situ resource utilization, and that's to say wherever you go, um, the robot's ability to take advantage of the resources and to turn those resources that are there into things that you can use through the course of your mission um, become absolutely important and is absolutely a value that the robots will hopefully bring to the mission before any of the humans uh, have arrived. Um, for the you can this can be done before preferably before but also after the habitat is created your ability to 
create long haul communication links. So your ability to, for the robots to drag and to, to spread out um, uh, antennas and other things like that have been some of the mission concepts that NASA has tried to explore, um, which says if I need a very, very long antenna, baseline antenna laid on the ground on the moon, how would I do that? Um, and to do that prior to the mission becomes really important. And then finally, and this is this is kind of on the maybe on the, the the tail end of the precursor missions, the idea that not only in terms of surveying, but if the robots are able to do clearing or provide, uh, frankly, landing pads for those uh, things that are trying to land on the surface, that that can be a really really good use case. The second scenario, um, and this is after the precursor missions, is when you start talking about habitat construction and just the maintenance of it, you know, one of the most dangerous things that our astronauts do um, are spacewalks. And in the case of the, the lunar surface or Mars, um, even though that may be either on a surface that has a little bit of gravity or in the case of Mars, an atmosphere that's not survivable, the risks are still very, very similar. And so all of the things that we can do in terms of clearing, digging of structures, manipulations of things out in the environment, um, all of those become really, really useful applications for robotics. Um, we, I, I mentioned antenna rays, so the ability for the robot to deploy antennas. Um, to provide maintenance and the assembly of living quarters and ISRU processing. So it's one thing to figure out how you're going to do ISRU and to prep yourself for it in the precursor mission. It's another thing for that piece of equipment to uh, begin processing those materials over very, very long timeframes and provide that resource to uh, presumably the humans that are occupying that habitat. Um, one of the tricky parts here um, when you're talking about construction is that there, there are many mission uh, scenarios that we've uh, talked about uh, at NASA in which we have folks that are at the Lunar Gateway that are um, providing supervisory control of the robots that are on the surface. Um, and in fact, there was some work that was done by my group where we had astronauts on the International Space Station operating a rover uh, that was in one of our Mars yards um, there in Mountain View, California. Um, that scenario in which you have somebody who is in a microgravity environment and they are needing to operate a robot over significant communication delays um, is, a, is a, from a human robot interaction standpoint, that's all new ground that we've only barely begun to start exploring. Um, and so that's certainly a, a, an area of exploration that, that needs to be kind of uncovered as we look at the different mission concepts for going to the moon and then to Mars. Um, one of the things not surprising for anybody who is a roboticist is you're talking about a minimum amount of supervisory autom autonomy that's needed right out of the bat. So the idea that you are going to do, be doing teleoperation for any of the equipment that is on the surface um, doing manipulation or any, um, any kind of manual labor, if you will, on the surface of that body, um, that's got to be done in some type of supervisory autonomy way. Um, and then finally, and this is super important, is to just appreciate that no plan survives first contact. Um, if you go back and look at all of the both manned and um, uncrewed missions that we've done to date, there is always that moment at which things didn't go the way we expected. And the idea that the robots need to embody flexibility um, is very, very important, especially at this early stage where you're talking about building, building and maintaining the environments that are gonna keep the humans alive. We'll see if this hopefully plays okay, but one, then the third scenario we have um, is the idea that the robot is co-located with the humans. So now we've advanced forward. So this is either on gateway and you have humans that are on the, the gateway um, or they're either on the lunar or Martian surface. Um, we've really looked at how do you have robots? Um, in this case, this is Astro B. So it is a free flyer in a microgravity environment. Um, and it provides really three functions. The first is it provides kind of a telepresence platform for ground controllers and for folks who are not on the actual uh, station or on the surface of the body. Um, and so it, it is the, you know, the idea that a ground controller 
to go figure out what the red blinking light is on the alarm on the equipment. They don't have to have an astronaut go do that for them. They're able to basically check out a robot. And in the case of a microgravity environment, they quite literally fly it over to the, the thing that they need to go look at and then are able to do uh, you know diagnostics or whatever on it. Um, the Astro B uh, also has uh, manipulation. So it has an arm that is stowed, at least in this video on the back. And the idea that it's able to, to, to move things in the world uh, you know, while flying through becomes a really, really great use case. The second scenario here is that it's able to act as an assistant for the astronauts. So the idea that that, uh, that little robot is sitting on the shoulder of an astronaut while they're doing an experiment and providing that as a telepresence platform for all of the scientists that are back on the ground. Um, again, it just has all kinds of value. If you've spent five minutes watching astronauts on the ISS, you can find that there's a lot of work that's being done. And if it's your science experiment that's being worked on the ISS, the ability to have a camera that you can move around becomes really, really useful. Um, and then finally, and this is, I would say, the, the holy grail for most of us roboticists um, is the idea that the Astro B is flying around um, and is doing autonomous work. So a lot of the, the testing and a lot of the dull work that you would do either in a, pl uh, a planetary habitat or on the ISS or Gateway, um, the idea that the Astro B is functionally a, uh, a Roomba for space um, is going around and doing these boring tasks that that ends up being a really, really good use case. And then finally, and, and this is one that doesn't actually get covered a whole lot, and I, I think needs to maybe be in the conversation a little bit more, is you know when we look especially back at the Apollo missions, we left a lot of gear um, up there on the moon. Um, the idea, now, it, we, those, those things that we left on the moon are there um, and didn't have any kind of autonomy or much remote control capability. And that just had to do with the size, weight, and power constraints that those missions were working with. Um, I would say that now technology has moved forward enough um, that for, let's say, lunar rovers or other things like that, or even the, like in this case, the, the lunar lander, the idea that that becomes a science platform that exists beyond the time that the humans are involved, um, those are absolutely capabilities that we can bring forth today. Um, we also have concepts like you see there, so that's Robonaut, which is um, one of the robots developed at uh, Johnson Space Center. The idea that that is able to be retrofitted on what was formerly a, um, a platform for human occupancy. Um, the idea that you can retrofit that before leaving such that now you have a very robust robotic platform that's able to kind of keep things operating and allows the science to continue after the humans have, uh, have had to depart. So those are those are the four different kind of mission scenarios that that at least we would talk about um, robotics being useful for um, for you know kind of the moon to Mars type scenarios. Um, so let me provide what I'll do in the last couple of slides here is just provide some strategies that I hope are are helpful and these are themes that I saw um, during my time uh, working space missions. So the first is um, it's very very easy to uh, kind of see the end game, to see the end vision of where you want to go and, uh, you know, want to get there as fast as possible. Um, I can tell you that in terms of missions, um, that things move a little bit slower when you're having to prove yourself every step of the way. Um, one of the best examples I can give of this is if you really, really look back at the foundations of especially the Apollo missions, um, really, really pay attention to how they were able to break down that problem. And for each of the, the Apollo missions prior to Apollo 11, um, they were proving out each of those technologies one by one. The idea that you're controlling the variables that you're testing for and do that very methodically, that that's, that's absolutely how you win in space. Um, so the, the examples I'm giving here, so in the upper left-hand corner, this was um, back in, I guess about 2010, I, it was when I had first come on to NASA, there was a platform called Spheres that was up on the uh, International Space Station. So these were free flyers. It was developed by MIT and the platform had been there for quite a while. There was, we, we kind of already had the mission concept in our heads for Astro B, but realized that there was a lot of proving that we needed to do along the way. And so the second picture that you see there, that is a sphere with a smartphone. Um, so this is again, 2010 era. So that is an, uh, an Android phone um, designed by Samsung that we modified and uh, uh, rated for human spaceflight. Um, 
there's an entire, if you're interested in how to do that, there, uh, if you Google my name and Google Tech Talk, I actually have a, an hour presentation that's all about how you can go to a store, buy a piece of electronics, and then what do you need to do to make that piece of electronics then rated and able to uh, to fly on a human spacecraft. Um, and so, so our first step was, can we take this platform that exists and add compute and sensors to it? Um, the next step in that um, that you see in the lower left-hand corner, um, that is us actually flying it. So long story short, about an, a year later, we were able to get that equipment up on station. We were able to connect it to the spheres and provided really some of our first existence proofs that the, the, the strategy that we were using was going to work from a compute and from a, um, a sensing standpoint. Um, the, the, the second picture you see there where it looks like a smartphone with a heat map on it. So that was a collaboration with, uh, with Google. Um, their Tango project, which is now kind of rolled into a lot of the uh, Android platforms that are coming out now. Um, that's a 3D uh, a depth sensing camera. And the question that we had was, you know, is this applicable? Um, one of the things that we discovered in that earlier flight was that a lot of the kind of consumer grade accelerometers and gyros and other things like that um, didn't do very well when they were in a microgravity environment. And especially if you look at uh, SLAM and, and visual SLAM and some of those other uh, methods for localizing robots, they strongly require a gravity vector uh, for doing their position estimation. And so the question was, how do we adjust that? And I'll say almost, and it was almost a, a, a little over, call, call it a decade later, um, Astro B then is flying. And so this whole slide is to say it's all about baby steps. It's all about uh, kind of finding a path and then very methodically working your way from what you think is the idea that you have uh, through to an actual flight article. Um, I'll go very quickly through this. So some strategies. Um, when, when we talk about robotic missions, that's really kind of delimit, de, um, de, designating it as non-manned or, or non-crewed missions. It's not that it is a robotic mission. It is that the, it is a robot that is carrying some science project. Um, what you find, uh, at least in my experience, one of the most anticlimactic parts of robotics is you realize that the, ro the robot is not the end, it's just the means to the end. Um, and in a lot of ways, the robot is just the, the thing that is there to carry the sensor uh, to that place and to go get the work done. Um, in that line, I would say, uh, if you want to really understand how to do space science, go make go make friends with a planetary geologist. Um, and I will add that myself coming from NASA and coming from the United States, um, when we talked about the, uh, the planetary geologists and the field geologists that were out here in Australia, that those sentences were usually filled with envy uh, in the fact that Australia is absolutely filled with some of the world's best geologists. Um, and so Australia definitely has an advantage here. And I would say, if you really want to understand what robots can go do, it's actually talking to the scientist that's going to help you bridge the why as to, as to why the robot needs to be a part of that equation. Um, I'd say learn about your history. Now I'll talk about a couple of resources in a second for that. Um, it, it turns out, all, you know, Lunar Gateway and a lot of these um, these terms that we're using now seem like they're new and the mission concept seems new. Um, but I'll just throw in there that most of, and, and I'll say 95% of the mission concepts that you hear about now, um, those ideas were born in the 50s and 60s while we were still figuring out how to do Apollo, that there were 100 year plans that people were working. And a lot of the, the mission concepts that you see today are us revisiting in a, in a new technology frame but the core meta missions are effectively still the same as a lot of the planning that was done in the 60s. And the good news is almost all of those mission concepts are available to the public to go look. Um, a good strategy for you, much like Astrobe uh, and what we tried to leverage there and, and for Robonaut is multi-use platforms. So the idea that you're building a sensor or a mobility platform or something for the Earth, Moon, Mars, in, in habitat, in space, the idea, the more places that you're uh, robot can be used, the more likely you are to be able to do this iteration uh, that I referred to earlier. Um, be careful with the use of autonomy. So one of the things as roboticists, we like to very, very much lean into autonomy and, and, and that that's where the solution lies. And I would say that especially for, uh, for space use, um, 
automation is the, the, the furthest, I would say, most space systems are. Supervised autonomy is probably the, the, the furthest that you want to go right now, given the culture. And, and that's to say that you want to keep the human on the loop. Um, we see that with our, our Mars rovers. You'll see that with the lunar rovers uh, when they're deployed. Um, the idea that you have a robot that is constantly checking back to verify that the plan it has made is correct um, is, is definitely the way to go for, for, I would say, winning and kind of understanding the way proposals are able to get evaluated and then, and then you know, sent to flight. Um, in terms of budget, I would say be cheap enough to fly, but good enough to succeed. Um, you know, it's, it's, so when you build these things, you, uh, systems, you don't get to go to space uh, and fix them. And so there is there is kind of a minimum bar that you need to achieve uh, in terms of being good enough to succeed. But then at the same time, like was kind of mentioned earlier, there's usually not an infinite budget that you're getting to work with. Um, you can't fly until you've flown. And that sounds like a paradox. And I'll, I'll agree, it absolutely is a paradox. Um, that that one of the things that is really really hard for especially new ideas to get traction on is uh, is is flight. You you need a flight heritage for folks to trust that your technology is going to work, um, and that's part of what I was referring to earlier with the with the small steps. And that's to say your ability to get involved in missions that are already either on their way or being proposed, and then working each of those variables little by little. That will get you a flight heritage that I can very much changes the conversation for your kind of relations and your proposals that you do then beyond that point. Um, advocacy is key within the space community. Um, and so I would say if, if you are planning on developing your system kind of in a vacuum and, and want to just focus on the tech and are not interested in kind of going to the conferences and networking with the larger community, um, then that puts you at a pretty significant disadvantage. Um, there, there's a bit of a there's a bit of advocacy that needs to happen for any mission to kind of get the momentum that it, it needs to 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 finally get funding for uh, for for flight. Um, and then finally, you know, we, and we we talked about the, the the kind of the monetary constraints a little bit in this. Um, that's really where partnerships with government, academia, and commercial um, really really is vital. So any kind of cost sharing that you can do, especially if you have uh, sensors or other things that may later be commercialized your ability to partner with commercial entities here, let's say for geology, your ability to develop a sensor that's useful for earth-based geology, but is also then can be potentially modified and flight certified. You could get a, uh, let's say a mining company or an oil and gas company to come partner with you very early on with the idea that they're able to leverage that technology and some other later uh, commercial ventures. Um, so this is the, the the part that I'm most excited about in the roadmap, and part of the reason, frankly, why I was why I wanted to get involved was Australia is uniquely qualified um, to to work in this realm, um, and that's to say that you know in terms of resource exploration, extraction, geology, mining, any of the heavy industries, um, you know we we joke that uh, you know your your Australia's founding. Um, uh, that, that they were in a land that was very inhospitable and was very difficult to work with, and yet the Australian uh, Australians have taken this and turned it into something great. Um, that's exactly what we're doing in space. Is it's a, a space um, is a very inhospitable environment, and the idea that Australia is uniquely experienced in taking a rough environment and turning it into something that's wonderful is something that's just frankly built into the Australian heritage, and that's that's pretty wonderful. Um, I'll also say Say that Australia right now has some of the largest autonomous vehicles that are operating in the world. Um, and so when we start talking about needing to do terraforming, when we're talking about needing to clear runways and landing sites and other things like that, um, Australia is uniquely positioned and has experience there. Um, we talked about remote operations earlier. Um, you have organizations like Arose and other groups that are really, really looking at the, the remote operations aspect of how do we uh, control systems and how do we manage the mission control aspects of those uh, missions. Um, the, uh, and one of my mentors, uh, is, so former astronaut Pam Melroy, 
um, talks a lot about space exploration ultimately is a logistics supply chain problem. And when you really look at the mission designs that are out there, you realize very quickly it really is a, okay, how do I get resources A to point B? And when I get to point B, how do I turn that into something else that allows me to get to point C? And when I'm at point C, how do I make that an environment in which it won't kill the humans uh, so that they can go execute you know, plan B? Um, and so you really, the, the Australia is very, very good at this. Um, again, from, from learning how to take uh, rough environments and turn them into uh, useful environments, um, there's a lot of experience here uh, that I would say that you need to not only leverage, but to, to use as the foundations of your proposals. Um, and then we talked about this earlier. I would, and I'll actually add, add an addendum to that to say that NASA and ESA uh, in that picture there, those are, those are basically geologists coming to look at um, some of the, uh, the fossil, um, the former life forms that you have in the stromatolites and other things up in the Pilbara. So Australia represents some of the closest uh, geology that we have to Mars. And so the idea that you're not only able to leverage that in terms of frankly getting expertise out to Australia um, that will help you form and those partnerships form a mission. Uh, but then the other thing is you guys have the best playground in the world to go test these technologies before you decide to take them to flight. Um, if you're looking for sources of information uh, or inspiration rather, um, there's a lot out there. And I would say um, all of these are, with the exception of the last one, which is a book, um, NASA has a lot of resources out there. The After LM, uh, they, basically that book goes through all of the different mission concepts uh, that Apollo worked. You'll see echoes of everything that we're doing today for our Moon to Mars missions. Um, the Decadal Survey, so if you want to know where NASA employees and, and, and mission people go for inspiration. Um, the decadal surveys is a constant stream of uh, basically problems that NASA knows that it can't solve on its own and wants people to start thinking about. Robotics is 100% part of the decadal surveys. Um, and so I would say if you wanted to track anything that says what is NASA thinking about for future missions and what could we do to get ahead of that curve, those all come through the decadal surveys. And then finally, for, for anyone who's in uh, in either robot in, uh, or engineering, you're going to laugh at me putting uh, this book that we have there called, it's colloquially kind of called SMAD, um, but that's your Mission Analysis 101. That book right there, it's a textbook, um, and it's usually taught at an um, undergraduate or graduate level to folks that are learning how to do rocket science. Um, what that'll teach you very quickly is how to design a mission, and frankly, how to realize that it's all fun and games until you get the humans involved. Uh, and then the humans make the missions much, much more complex and much, much more the logistics train that we were talking about earlier, um, which is great for us to be able to do that analysis. I would say take that also as a testimony to the fact that robots have a place in this equation um, and that we don't get to succeed in uh, space travel unless we have those robots in the mix. And then the final thing I'll leave you with, and, and I'll say this is something that I hope that I see, um, and that's, that's that when we talk about the Canada arm, it's not referred to as the arm that was built in Canada or the arm that was built by Canadians. Um, it is the Canada arm, full stop. Um, I I'd, I'd hope to uh, see a day in which we are talking about the Australia rover um, or the Australia mass spec sensor that was at Mars and found the best usable water. Um, I would say that the there's a national, for the Canada arm, there's a pride in when you're a roboticist and you say the Canada arm, there's a, there's a pride and a respect in terms of uh, this piece of equipment was designed by this nation um, and that represents reliable space robotics. I absolutely think that Australia is in the right position to take advantage of that kind of a um, technological leap forward that allows us to talk about Australia's contribution to man's ability to survive and to thrive uh, in the kind of space environments that we're talking about. And so with that, I'll see if there's any questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. Um, I volunteer to help name some of those uh, technologies. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I also should declare that that uh, my background was as a geologist and, and I could do with some more friends. So if people are making their way through your strategy suggestions, I'm just putting that out there. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so I think that there are some questions. Uh, John or Ross, would you like to pass them over?
Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jonathan Rolston. Yeah, thanks Sue, very much. And thank you to our three presenters. They were excellent. Uh, very exciting. Each one different and each one, I think, providing opportunities for us to engage. We've had a number of questions that have come through and um, uh, we'd like to um, uh, give everybody an opportunity to, to speak. I think there's a, there's a what we have about 25 minutes now to, to talk through your questions. So as we raise these questions, please put them through the Q&A chat box and we'll do our very best to ask our distinguished panel here today. There's probably one question um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off, Mark. This one actually comes from me because um, I'm, I'm curious. Why is it that a person who is working at NASA is now working here in Australia? It seems like a, you know, you had the dream job. Why, why here? What drew you to Australia to do this kind of work that you're doing? It's a great question. And, and I know it seems strange. Um, I, the let, let's just say, if, if you wanted to believe a lot of the things that I just said, um, let the fact that I left NASA to come to Australia be at least my testimony to the fact that Australia is where a lot of those uh, really, really hard missions and really, really hard robotics things can be solved. Um, so in the case of Woodside, we are looking at how we can leverage robotics for a lot of the oil and gas production that we do. Um, know that it, it took maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes of talking with um, the folks that I initially talked to at Woodside to realize that a lot of the problems that are being solved here in the commercial sector, 110% apply to space travel and to robots' ability to, su to succeed in, in space. It's also not by accident, frankly, and I'll admit that Woodside is a little unique in this regard, um, but Woodside has par a partnership with NASA. Um, so we work with Johnson Space Center. We have a Robonaut that's on site here, and we're leveraging a lot of the technologies that were that are used on the International Space Station for a lot of, let's say, the manipulation tasks or the mobility tasks that we do here at Woodside. Um, NASA was a very, let's just say my time at NASA was life changing and I'm so very glad that I had that experience. Um, I'll say that coming to Woodside, it is also interesting to work a lot of those same problems, but to have the application of those solutions be immediate. So we can take that equipment, we can take it to site and we can use it and demonstrate it in a way that that closes a feedback loop that instead of the space exploration being on the front end, where we then see if there's commercial applications, I'm able to put the commercial application up front, test it there, and then um, and then there's definitely a very tight feedback loop between the work that we're doing and what Johnson Space Center and the rest of NASA then is doing on a going forward basis. Oh, uh, a, a fantastic answer. And, and um, look, we're, we're thrilled to have you in Australia. So I'm glad to be here. Mark, for that. Thank you. Um, next question coming through, there was certainly a strong uh, interest in, I guess, the mining and resources side of things. I, I'll, I'll throw this to, to, to Nick, Mark, Ed, if you'd like to respond. Uh, two questions probably. One is, what would be the level of interest in asteroid mining in general, as opposed to, I guess, planetary mining? And what would be the most useful products that are being sought from those different planetary environments? Yeah, I can start to that one. Um, is there an interest in asteroid mining? Oh, I find it very interesting. Um, so I think down the track, it's something that you know everyone might consider, um, but for short term, uh, focuses on on the moon and how we and how we can provide products for those who need it. And then what those products may be. Um, the big one coming up first is fuel, so ice. Um, and then from there, it could be as simple as your product is moving regolith, so moon dirt, over the shelter for the astronauts to provide radiation protection. Yeah, and I, thought I can follow up on that one as well. Um, NASA and JPL were looking at a thing called the Asteroid Redirect Mission at one stage. The idea there was to get close and personal to asteroids to see just what the value of them could be. Um, initial estimates indicate that they might contain uh, rather rarer type minerals and um, elements such as some of the rare earth elements. And currently um, uh, there is a real strong desire and need for some of those and there's, there's some thought that maybe those could be uh, on the asteroids and it could be a very rich source of not only that but other potential materials. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark, did you have any 
general observation, I guess it, 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 it seems to be different seasons. Sometimes asteroids of great interest, other times Moon to Mars is their current focus. Yep. So I I would say that when uh when when asteroids are in the focus, that's because we suddenly have a very need a, a very you know big concern. Um, one of the that I would say the 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 thing that I'll leave this with is robotics especially is uniquely capable for working on asteroids, and that's because um, that is such a unique environment. Um, the the idea that you would do crewed space flight to an asteroid. Is probably not in the books, and it just has to do with the physics. So, because you're in a microgravity, such a microgravity environment, and uh, I would say that for the robot missions that we've done to asteroids, if you look very, very carefully, the the idea that your static forces and other things suddenly become your primary forces, you really, when you start looking at those mission models, it really kind of warps your brain with respect to what is the primary forces that you're dealing with, and how would you, for instance, drill into um, an asteroid where you're pushing against it, you've got to somehow attach yourself to this thing before you can start uh, drilling through it. That, that just working through those mission concepts, if nothing else, is a good exercise because it really kind of bends your brain a little bit with respect to the assumptions that you make when you're working in a 1G environment like we have on Earth. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, answer. Great answer. Um, on, on that, uh, I think there's a great interest in like understanding where in Australia there's, there's pathways for us to begin. And I, I thank you all for making a, a number of suggestions that I guess there are vectors or opportunities for us to begin to engage. There's one aspect in particular, there's a question that came through uh, about effectively, or I guess uh, the spectrum of remote operations, right from I guess joystick level control to semi-automated to I guess fully autonomous. And uh, let me get the question right, um, uh, during your presentation, Mark, the comment was um, yeah, autonomy is not only driving, but using payload results, results, science payloads to decide where to go and where the next site is going to be. I guess they're talking about reasonable levels of, of autonomy. And in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, almost everything will have to be at some level of supervised remote operations. I mentioned that because there's a very strong interest in Australia about remops. Uh, where, where do you see that spectrum? Where do you see the Australian robotics community being able to, to, to link in and at what level would you suggest the good places to begin? Well, the the really good news here is from a from a mission concept, a lot of the the, the kind of the ways that you could be successful. We have all of the the Mars uh, rover and, and Mars landers uh, that really provide us with a, a good existence proof that supervised autonomy would be a good strategy to use. Um, I think that in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that Australia has as many, let's say, offshore platforms, um, the, the, the mining operations and other things, a lot of those are remotely uh, controlled and remotely um, worked. And so I would say that, that we're, we definitely have the intellectual capital to make a really, really great dent in that kind of a mission concept. The, the reason why I, I suggested, though, that you need the human on the loop is um, when you look at all of, and whether this be the, the rovers that we've placed on other bodies or even what we do for satellites, if you look at even the most bleeding edge satellite that's put into orbit, um, those are using what for us is very kind of rudimentary, and I hesitate to even call it autonomy. In some cases, it's just scripts that are running. And if the, if the script hits a, an edge case that it doesn't understand, it puts itself into a safe mode and it waits for the human to provide what its next step needs to be. Um, so my, my suggestion that you maybe not propose something to be fully autonomous, that was more of a how do you optimize yourself for the kinds of missions and the kind of operations NASA and ESA and JAXA and all of the partnerships, um, the other nations that, that Australia is getting involved with here, um, that you know at least what their mode of operation is and kind of how cautious they are with respect to having full autonomy uh, kind of in play with the missions that they're executing. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you for that response. Um, Nick, or Ed, did you want to contribute any more on that particular topic? I mean, Ed, with the, your, your remote communications is, is, you know, tracking and comms is bread and butter. What extent do you see in, in I guess, that autonomy spectrum for communicating with um, planetary activities and objects? 
Yeah, just I think I think Mark's uh, given a, a good um, summary of that. That's true. Uh, there's a good reason why we're still going to be communicating from Earth to the Moon, um, and that is because there needs to be some um, overarching human control in the in the times when it's needed. Um, although this, this striving for as much autonomy as possible, um, as uh, someone said, I think no plan or even program survives first contact. <laughs> so there'll be some degree of even um, reprogramming required of these autonomous vehicles as well. But there's no question that there'll be a wide spectrum of, of uh, high levels of autonomy compared to low levels of autonomy, depending on whether you're doing rendezvous and docking or proximity operations on uh, surface or even the landing uh, capability. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, I like the link that you made, Ed, between effectively the, the, the work that you do and how it does actually come down to ground-based robotics in activities such as, you know, CalVal. And um, so I, I'm keen to see how we can identify activities for the people attending today, how they can see that the, the robotics technologies that they're developing and engaging in can actually connect with things that are already happening here in Australia. So uh, thank you for that, for that message there. Just to add to Ed's remarks, uh, one of the things that more modern instruments are generating as a problem on uh, science missions off Earth is they can generate huge quantities of data. But one of the associated problems is the, the need for um, radiation hardening gives you somewhat limited compute power on board uh, most uh, probes and rovers. And so the large amount of data coupled with the limited amount of compute power uh, generates a need for quite high bandwidth com communications back to Earth in order to be able to process all the data that that rover or probe is collecting. Uh, it simply lacks the capability of processing to the, the level that we do here on Earth um, on board for reasons of you just can't put that much compute power on it. So those communication links are, are really good for processing all the data that uh, modern probes are capable of collecting. Great, thanks, Ross. I have a question for Nick that I think was reflected in some of the questions earlier. You mentioned the technical advisory groups who are, I guess, providing input to the current roadmaps. What would be the process if people listening here today to, if they felt they had something to contribute, what would be the process to actually to be involved? Yeah, so absolutely. So step one is send me an email. Um, so one of the things we're concerned about, not concerned, but just need to be aware of that, we can't be seen to favouring um, one particular commercial interest over another. So it's important that you are either a um, government organisation or academia or an industry body that's for everybody, uh, not just for yourself, but if you want to um, contribute, um, absolutely. And even if you don't fit into those categories, uh, we'd still love to talk and see what you're doing and what, what your plans for the future are. Great, thanks. And you, you, your contact details are available in the presentations as well. So thanks, Nick. Excellent. Ross, did you have any other questions there before I jump into my next one? Or... Oh, there's a thumbs up. Um, there's this interesting tension. Uh, I throw this to the, to, the, to the experts here to see what you can respond. Um, you know, there's the, there's the sort of space 1.0 model of the way we roll out technologies based on, you know, heritage, even going back to the 50s and 60s, as you mentioned, Mark, uh, uh, coupled with an appetite for, I guess, rapid development and, you know, talking to, can Australia play to the space 2.0 sort of realm? How does that all fit in the kind of the timelines required to establish some heritage, to understand who the major players are, to develop those relationships with the right kind of wisdom and humility and, and offering. Uh, do you have anything that you could offer along those realms to help people see how, what that kind of pathway would be um, so they can sort of sustain the developments over the needed timeframes? I can, I can throw a couple examples out there for you. So, um, you know, we live in an amazing age. If you're wanting to work in the vacuum of space, the, your ability to get ride share 
with CubeSats. Um, so earlier in the the, the presentation, um, it was mentioned that uh, the CSIRO has a, a I think it was a three U CubeSat. That form factor and your ability to get that sensor or um, that compute or that mobility piece into space. Um, that's frankly, a, a, you basically, you're able to work with integrators that will get you into low Earth orbit um, and that you can fully test out uh, those, those kind of concepts. Um, that didn't exist, I'd say that didn't really even exist 10 years ago. Um, so in terms of your ability to test in space, it is a brave new world right now in terms of CubeSats being able to allow people access to that resource. Um, the, the second thing I'll, I'll throw in there, so for the robotics piece, so Astrobe, that the, the platform that I mentioned earlier, um, so that was born out of the Spheres engineering group that, that I helped run. That's a, that is a resource that is available to the world. So part of my team's job was to take either, whether it be software or sensors or um, even mobility and manipulation type platforms, um, and help them fly those to the International Space Station, get astronaut time and be able to execute those experiments. I, I would say, I'd, I'll be honest with you, I don't ever remember having a conversation with any of those folks about how much it was gonna cost. Um, the good news is the, I'll say the, the, the US taxpayer has already paid for that resource to be there. In a lot of cases, it's just a matter of um, frankly talking with the facility to see what it would take to get your experiment onto the International Space Station. Now, that's not to say that you don't have to cover your own labor, you don't have to cover the assembly and creation of your own thing that you're gonna fly, but the biggest, if actually, if you look back at any of the mission con concepts that I talked about earlier, your biggest cost is launch. Your biggest cost is just getting that thing into whatever orbit or whatever body it is. In the case of the International Space Station, that's more or less already paid for um, if you're willing to work within the form factor and the compute and all of the constraints that come with working on Astrobe, um, you, that whole that whole problem about not being able to fly until you've already flown, you can check that box by using that as a test bed, uh, and then you know, and then go from there with respect to whether you're building your own and flying your own at that point. Excellent. Thank you. Very very helpful insights and comments. Uh, Nick or Ed, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? broad question about space 1.0, 2.0, how does, how do we move forward as a robotics community to start to, to partner in? I, I would, I would say we're at space 1.5. Um, we're in that beautiful transition point where it space truly is a logistics problem and the access to space is being solved by so many individual people and the price cost has just plummeted, like absolutely plummeted. So there are some things that weren't possible 10 years ago just for budget reasons but it's not only the access to space so if you if getting to space is really expensive that thing you launch better work but now if it's only 10 percent of the price well maybe you don't need those gold plate connectors you can just use copper so there's kind of there's a there's a spiraling effect that it's quicker and it's that rapid iteration and as the mark in the you know, rather than flying the whole thing maybe you're just flying the actuator you know it, it's step by step by step by step and it's just the you can get a launch opportunity now, which you can measure in months rather than years. And that's really the game changing aspect. Great, thank you, thank you, Nick. Um, Ed. Yeah, I'll take a, a slightly different uh, tack. Um, and that is that one of the roles that CSRO has is to build those relationships with industry and universities and other entities in Australia uh, for the common good and to catalyze capabilities by making uh, creating opportunities to work together and that's exactly what we will do and i'm sure we're already doing in robotics and i know we're planning for another area um, of space 2.0 working with smes and other industries and universities and i think that's a real niche for us to uh to help that out and make it happen thanks Ed. excellent um it, i i'm personally sort of relatively new to the, the whole space realm my background has been more mining related, but it feels like a different season right now. And it's hard for me to tell whether that's just because it's relatively new to, to, to the work that I'm doing, or if it actually does feel different. And Nick, you mentioned 1.5, you know, uh, Ed, um, Nick, Mark, would you say it's a different 
a different moment right now for us here in Australia, and uh, probably one of probably the more significant opportunities for us to, to deploy our automation robotics technology. I'll, um, Let me jump in there real quickly on that one. Um, I used to work in the European space industry uh, about 20 years ago, and, and, and I came back all excited to Australia, hoping that we would kickstart space activities here, but alas, we weren't ready for it. Um, but so much has changed in the last couple of years. It's such an exciting place now that we've got real opportunity. We've got real energy. We've got a real self-belief that we can do this. And I have never seen anything like it before. So I'm a real optimist in this area now. And I think if we just put our nose to the grindstone and build those relationships and leverage what we're good at, and I think Mark was, was, was challenging us here. He said, we've got some of the best geologists and, and roboticists and people like that. We've really got a great chance now and I'm excited. Mm. That's, that's great. Thank you, Ed. I'll just add that we better. Uh, I, I want to believe that I, I'm getting in on the ground floor of what will be a really, really great legacy for Australia. Um, mm. And I think that, like what Nick mentioned earlier, your barrier to entry to try these things out, to do the, the kind of fast and furious prototyping this is a this is the age in which we can do those kind of things, and I I think that Australia's ability to kind of step up to this proverbial plate um, and to really get some good wins, I think that frankly the country has never been in a better position to to start exercising some of those talents. Mm, fantastic, and I like the word Ed used. You, you did both inspire and challenge us a bit to, to to be a little bit more ambitious and a bit more intentional. So thank you, Mark, for that. My question is just pop through here, which I think actually links very well with the notion of how do you establish a flight heritage? How do you get that track record when you're, you know, you've got capabilities in other areas, but not necessarily in that particular place. Um, the notion of utilising Australia's terrestrial analogues as a, as a kind of a testing ground, a proving ground to make, take some of the developments perhaps from different sectors that might be at a high TRL for that particular domain, but then demonstrate it in environments that are representative of Moon and Mars asteroid environments. Uh, what sort of opportunities do you see for us there? I know you referenced that in the slide. Um, is, that, is that a good place for us to, to, to begin? It's, it's a good place to begin. The, the important part, let me preface this and say that analogs only get you so far. Uh -huh. So, so the, the biggest thing that, at least in my experience, that an analog gets you is when you start talking about the operations um, the, the mode of operation that you're going to achieve. So if, if remote operations and other things is one of the amazing skill sets that Australia is bringing to the table here, the idea that you're putting the equivalent of astronauts out into, let's say, the Pilbara, um, and they're working on things, and that you're very at a very high fidelity trying to emulate the way those operations would actually happen if they were on another body. Um, that that's that is probably the biggest value that I've seen analogs bring to the table, and that's certainly why NASA um, and and all of the other space agencies have been using analogs for some time. The the real thing that that um, Australia I think is unique here is the fact that the fidelity that you can achieve um, here, especially for for Mars or the lunar surface, um, is is as good as any other place on the planet. So we had had. My group previously worked analogs in um, the deserts of Chile, as you kind of saw in the presentation. We've been up to the northern Arctic. We had pretty much anything that even resembled a crater in California. We probably rolled a robot through. Um, and so uh, having, I guess, experienced all of those analogs, I can tell you that that's absolutely a national resource that you have here and that the information that you'll gain from that um, is really, really important. And the important caveat to this is just to make sure that there's, it's that last like 20% where, you know, you're in a 1G environment, you have vegetation around you. And so your ability to detect life is a little bit tougher when everything's alive. Um, you know what I mean? There's certain kind of caveats that, and, and assurances that you need to make that you're not capturing the wrong things in your analogs that are then driving assumptions that may make your mission fail in a way that you don't want to have those moments where you're like, oh, yeah, we just didn't think of that. Um, sometimes an analog can lead you down a path where those assumptions might lead you wrong when you get to the actual mission itself. Thank you. Thank you. As you say, it, it's 
I uh, appreciate you adding the nuances to it all, but it's part of the part of the journey, not, not necessarily the destination, but probably a very powerful thing to leverage for us in the short term. The, the other thing that you'll find is it's humbling. Yeah. So yeah. If, if you want to, my, I would suggest to anybody come up and you can even do this yourself. Come up with a mission concept that's you and your 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 wife and your kids. Um, uh, give everybody radios and then try to plan doing something in which you're not you're not co-located and you're needing to execute a task. Um, what you actually have on paper when you walk into that scenario versus what you have when you're done um, are usually two very different things. And what I think the analogs do is they very quickly taught you to be very, very humble and, and I'll say in a way conservative with respect to how you build those plans and how you make sure that that mission is gonna succeed. Um, that's that's a good experience for everybody at all levels of kind of the mission stack, everything from the entry level engineer to the mission commander themselves. If you haven't lived a couple of those analogs and, and frankly lived analogs in which you failed, um, that, that those are lessons that you probably need to go capture. And you guys have the best playground in the world to go capture those lessons. Well, uh, thank you. It's, it's great, great advice. Appreciate that very much. There's a question. It's just popped in. Probably I'll throw this one to Nick. I'll, I'll read, it, read it out. Um, what is the best way to leverage the road mapping work, maybe for Sue as well, that the ASA and um, uh, I guess AROSE are doing, the Technical Advisory Group's ASA? What's the best way to leverage the, the current road mapping activity? Um, um, you know, should, should this be, how do, we, how do we best make use of the, of the collective resources that we're putting together here? Um, absolutely. So uh, reach out uh, so we know who you are, step one, because um, there's all these great people out there doing all this great stuff and we just don't know what's going on. So if we know about you, we can consult you. Um, that's important. And then so the next end of this year, most of the roadmaps, well, some of, some of the roadmaps will be coming out. Um, and then from there, make, really make sure that you try and align with those roadmaps. Um, and then in addition to that, we have opportunities for funding. Um, so for supply chain to get your part into the global supply chain for a demonstrator project where you can go out where we want to get you in space, you can demonstrate what you want to do and then a final trailblazer mission um, in 2025. So there are big opportunities out there, but for us, it's really important that you can consult with your industry and that you form partnerships. Um, you know, there's very few people in Australia that could really do it all by themselves. Um, and unless you're one of those very large groups, we strongly recommend you find partners and work on something together. Thank you, Nick. And I guess, Sue, the roadmap development as well, you know, certainly the conversations that have been on, how do we maximise the collective intellect and, and uh, insights to, to, to move together? That's, has that been uh, you, um, your perspective as well? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we're only going to know what people think if they tell us. So I encourage everybody to, uh, yeah, jump on board and and um, and have a say. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we're probably almost getting to the end of the question times. So I'll just leave, leave the door open for a couple more minutes if anybody would really uh, like to raise something here with the panel together. Um, otherwise, I'll just quickly, briefly go through um, some of the feedback that we've received from the survey, so which I think was um, quite interesting. I'll quickly grab uh, Peter Kinney's uh, question, um, and and maybe Nick may wish to reply to it as well. Um, and that's about access to space and assumptions about cost. And in his presentation, Nick mentioned. Um, not wanting to have multi-ton, hugely expensive rovers um, as a, a, a one big flagship project. It's more about uh, rapidly iterating and doing the, um, the small and the many rather than the large and the few to steal some words from defence. And so low cost access for lighter payloads that can rapidly iterate uh, I think fits very, very well with the Australian concept of build, test, learn, build, test, learn, and iterate through. Um, and though I'm 
not hugely in favour of the expression. This is a, a space 2.0 thing, and it's based on the assumption that your access is a lot cheaper than it's traditionally been. Yeah, Ross now is the point there. The one more thing I'd like to add is, for us, it's important that this doesn't become a winner take all. So even if you're late to the game, so maybe in two years you decided you want to be in space, involved in space robotics, you can put that one part or you can be part of that one thing. We don't want to say, oh, sorry, you missed the funding opportunity. It was a year ago. There's going to be nothing big for the next 10 years. So for us, it's really about, look, if, you want to, if you're a big company who's interested and you want to build five different projects, you can do that. If you're a small SME and you want to build one leg, one wheel, you can do that. You know, if you're just university and you just want to do that one little piece, you can do that as well. So for us, it's really important that everybody has an opportunity to be involved. Um, it's really, it's the lowering the barriers to entry. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ross, and thank you, Nick. I'd like to give uh, our three panel members an opportunity, maybe just if they'd like to sort of close with any general comment or statement. You've said some wonderful things already, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back at the end of this if you've got nothing further to add, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Ed, Nick, Mark, is there anything you, you'd really want a message to come through to, to the people uh, listening today to the webcast? If you're going to email me, make sure you attach pictures. Um, <laughs> there's lots of really complicated things in space that are hard to explain, but a lot of people get robots. So it's really powerful for us to show our stakeholders this is what we're doing. Um, so if you do have them, and if you go and do an analog test, please send us your thing covered in red dirt. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Fantastic. Um, Ed, anything to your you message you'd love us to hear? Yes. Um, let's believe in ourselves. Um, let's think big um, and make it happen. Yeah. Always believe in yourself and keep pushing. Fantastic. Mark? I'll just add that it's very easy for all of us to, to romanticize and to put those who uh, came before us on the shoulders that we're kind of standing on with respect to space travel um, and to feel like that's, that's someone else or that's a different time or that I can't do that because and then, you know, fill in the blanks. And I would actually say um, myself having uh, at least the honor of working with some of these folks, you got to remember that the folks that were back in Mercury, Gemini and Apollo um, and all of the space missions that have happened since then, that those were just normal people like you and I um, that decided that they were going to overcome whatever those barriers are. Um, and so I, I would be be sure not to put it in third, third person and not think of it as something that you can do or Australia can do. Um, it is absolutely something that we can do, and I'm excited, frankly, to see everybody starting uh, in Australia to start getting involved in this, because um, you've been a partner in the space game for a very, very long time, and the fact that you uh, that the, the country gets to be a first-class citizen along the ranks of the rest of the nations that have contributed, um, that's been a long time coming, and I would uh, I would hope that everybody takes advantage of this. Fantastic. Uh, th thank you, Mark. Hey, the, the, the words that come to mind fr from all of our panel men members, are, it's, it's exciting, it's an opportunity, you know, take it, take it to heart, we're able to do things, it's accessible, there's challenge in there, uh, and in fact, interestingly enough, uh, when I asked you what you really want to, what's the message, it was almost less about space and more about what we want to do as people, you know, in Australia and things we want to do as, uh, as a great nation together. So. Thank you for those inspiring, challenging, encouraging words to us all. It, it, it helps people, helps us, helps me see where I can contribute together to do something uh, wonderful with you. So thank you so much for that feedback. Um, we're going to, uh, actually we're on time. What, what, a, what a wonderful thing. Um, Sue, would you like me to roll into a little bit of feedback on the survey so far or? Yes, yeah, sure. There was one quick question from the chat for please, Nick. Please and do. that. And that is, will the uh, um, Moon to Mars grants be delayed or are they still on track to open in a few months from now? Uh, I'll give the general uh, pending COVID. Um, supply chain should be coming out the next couple of months. The demonstrator and trailblazer will follow that. Um, so step one is to get the supply chain out as soon as we can and then from there. Um, but they should be rolling out soonish, pending all goes well, all that kind of good stuff. Great. Thanks, Nick. 
Yeah, John, I'm very curious now to hear uh, what you have found from our survey. Fantastic, I'll turn it to Mick. Yeah, thank you, Sue. So, uh, look, I'm only gonna be five, 10 minutes tops. Um, so you, the survey was sent out uh, earlier this week. I wanna thank you for uh, those people who've managed to put a response in, very, very helpful. Also say that if you haven't had the opportunity to respond to the survey, it's just 10 questions. Uh, I think the link has been sent there. I will probably resend it to you as well. Your, your feedback is very important and it will be reflected in the updated roadmap. So I encourage you to, to, to put your comments down um, because we will read them and, and synthesize that uh, in the roadmap. There are probably 10 questions there and there are a lot of very interesting responses. So I'm just gonna probably touch on the five probably most interesting questions um, uh, and give that sort of feedback. The first question, you know, please describe your involvement in robotics and related fields. Uh, I think the clear message that came through there, Australia has a broad range of relevant capability and involvement. This is from uh, deep tech investment, university science um, and research, government agencies doing R&D and robotics, uh, enthusiasts, uh, very passionate people who are engaged in societies and things like that, as well as companies that were directly engaged in the design and the development of robotic component systems. So the simple kind of broad message from there at this stage is Australia has a broad capacity uh, and capability in robotics uh, and it's, it, it's, it's surprisingly wide when we put them all together and look at them. The next question was um, along the lines of, um, you know, briefly list your organization's current robotic technology, science capability and activities. This was very broad, right from the capacity to invest in the technology, not so much the technology developer, but supporting those people developing robotic technology uh, and all the various under underlying um, technologies, vision, AI, control, sensing, perception, mobility, and so on. And again, the takeaway from that, even at this high level is a surprisingly high level of capability that's and relevant uh, here in Australia. The next question, I guess, was looking more towards uh, engagement in the, specifically in the space sector. Those two first questions were really about where are you with, with robotics and automation technology? So the question was, to what extent are you involved in the space sector? This was interesting. The previous two questions were very broad and a lot of uh, different uh, sectors and capabilities represented. This question was much more polarized. There seemed to be people who were currently significantly involved in space activity or really not at all. So that was an interesting um, um, outcome. The next question was, well, how can your organization become more engaged? And it was uh, some very, very good input. Um, really looking at things like increased capital, uh, increased awareness and connection, things like workshops, webinars, relationships, very important. Uh, increased know-how, um, increased expertise, particularly in space specific technologies. Certainly some of the questions that came through today were interested in finding out, well, where are those reference designs? What are the needs, where are the gaps? Who do we speak to about getting more informed about space specific um, sector technology? And then increased facilities, you know, calibration, validation centers. What, what can we do to do that whole end-to-end -end sort of flight qualification capabilities? And, and I guess, that involves the capture of what we already have here in Australia that we could be utilizing for that end. So that, they were all very positive talking about we could increase this, increase this, increase this uh, to be more engaged. Um, and finally, probably the last question, uh, where do you think Australian robotics is with respect to space right now? Uh, uh, some good words, I thought this was interesting and I'll represent what was there. Some of the words were things like emerging, you know, first steps, we have a lot of potential. Overall, uh, there was a strong sense of opportunity and, and, and uh, a desire to identify those kind of applications and use cases, plus some specific activity that's already going on. And it was mentioned a number of times about CubeSat and how those sort of activities are really important. Um, they, they, as they say, if, 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 you, if you're humbled and, and, uh, and educated through a terrestrial analog, then something like this is very important and, and for lessons learned. So we are already doing things in that realm as well. Uh, some other, uh, I won't identify the individuals, but some of the words I really liked, what are we doing to push the envelope? 
you know, uh, how, how are we highlighting our success stories so far? You know, how do we engage more deeply with the agencies, both here in Australia and overseas? So for me, that was sort of a very encouraging um, uh, response. People very keen to see how do we engage? How do we, how do we press more? We want, we want to know more and see how we can be applying our robotics R&D, our capability know-how to address and, and get engaged in some of the very, very exciting opportunities over the next two, three, five, 10, 50 years here in Australia. So that was just a capture of the uh, some of the feedback that we received so far with the survey. 100% encourage you if you haven't actually uh, contributed, it's very helpful. Um, those those inputs will be put together, summarised a bit more details once we've had more time to process uh, some of the more uh, further inputs and results. But it's overall very positive message, and one that I think aligns very well with 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 what the presenters have um, have offered to us today. Um, thanks very much, Sue. Thanks, Jonathan. And yeah, two people were busily trying to complete the survey during the workshop, so <laughs> it has been quite popular. And uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we encourage you, if you haven't had the chance already, to please fill that in. The survey is actually based on the general survey that I mentioned uh, during my presentation. It doesn't really matter which one you fill in. The second one just has a couple more very space sector specific questions. So depending on how you would like to contribute, you can even complete both surveys. Um, but I would uh, just like to finish off by telling you what the next steps in this process are. So this is our second last workshop. Uh, and our final workshop will be held on the 23rd of July and is focused on how we apply robotics to environmental problems here in Australia. So. Uh, you still have time to register for that workshop if you are interested. The process that we're now going through is actually trying to compile some of the information from the workshops together and uh, having our co-chairs work on writing, consolidating some of that information from the surveys and actually putting together the uh, written part of the roadmap, uh, which hopefully we'll get a first draft done off by September uh, with the view to have the roadmap released before the end of the year if everything goes well. So thank you everyone for your time today. I'd particularly like to thank our speakers, Nick Larkham from the Australian Space Agency, Ed Cruzens from CSIRO, Mark Masiri, from, uh, formerly from NASA, now based at Woodside in Perth. And uh, also thank you very much to Jonathan Ralston and to uh, Ross Dungavel for from CSIRO for fielding the Q&A and um, trying to dissect the survey results on the run. Thank you very much. Uh, and obviously the co-chairs for this uh, sector uh, section of the uh, roadmap are uh, Jonathan Ralston, uh, Ross Dungavel, Nick Larkham and Mark Masiri. So thank you all. Um, uh, please fill out the survey if you haven't had the chance already. Um, look out for the final workshop and then, yes, please stay in touch while we put together the roadmap and hopefully we'll have something that you can, um, you know, look forward to before the end of the year. So we'll close it there. Thank you everyone for your time.